TB, uh, as, uh, it's interesting to be in an emerging disease committee. I was in hope that we wouldn't have anything to report. Uh, but we've kind of been in the TB business here for just a little bit, and particularly in southeast in Indiana, not too far from here, uh, uh, right across from Cincinnati down in southeast Indiana. Uh, the other issues that we've had over the last few years, so we, we used to spend a lot of time in northern Indiana, uh, back in the Pseudorabies days and Pseudorabies Eradication Program in Swine, spend more time in southern Indiana now, a year ago right now, in southwest Indiana with high path avian influenza and in our turkey industry, so we were dealing with that. And then before we completed that task, we got a phone call that we were dealing with TB in southeast Indiana. So let me go back just a little bit to give you a rundown on this. This all started with a phone call from the state of Ohio. Dr. Forshee called me, along with Dr. Skrufsky, the federal veterinarian in Ohio, just a few days before Thanksgiving in 2008, and of course they weren't calling to wish me a happy Thanksgiving. I knew something was up. Uh, both of them were calling, and sure enough, we had a single beef cow that had initially been traced to Ohio, and it turns out it was purchased out of an Indiana market. Now, I told my veterinarians on my staff, uh, we have some really good veterinarians for the Board of Animal Health distributed around the state, and I've told them over the years that the sign of a good veterinary epidemiologist is to make sure that every positive animal is an import. <laughs> it doesn't belong to us. Well, here Ohio's calling, and sure enough, he gave me the name of the consigner, and I looked in the database, and indeed we had that person in the database. And I'm grateful for our premises registration program in Indiana. We've been registering premises for a decade now just to know where animals are located. I don't care how many are on the sites, just that so we have animals on those sites. And indeed, this was a registered premises. So we went to that site, and I actually drove that property the day after Thanksgiving just to drive by and said, how in the world could this place possibly have tuberculosis? We didn't have it, the trace completed at that time. Small herd, Franklin County, Indiana, near Laurel, Indiana, if you're familiar with that area. Uh, had a handful of cows on the hillsides down there. As how in the world would this place have become infected? And sure enough, we visited with the lady. A uh, widow lady had ran cows on this uh, rough ground, for example, and we began to describe the cow and when it was sold, etc. The ID was not especially good on this trace. And she said, well, you know, that must have been the cow that had the bad eye. I said, oh, that cow is ours, because the cow was railed out in Pennsylvania because it was suspect because they had a bad eye. And under FSIS, FSIS rules, they're railed out. So sure enough, that was ours. We couldn't find any other positive animals on that property. We tested them twice. The lesion on that one cow was about the size of the end of your thumb, and so, but we had a confirmed case of tuberculosis in Indiana. Now what happened was, and where it went a little bit further was in 2009, less than a mile from that initial farm was a cervid farm. Red deer, elk, fallow deer, etc. And we knew that site was there, high fence operation there, been there for since 2004. Well he sold, he was looking to sell the property and liquidate the deer from the site. He took some of those animals to an Indiana State inspected facility. Some of those red deer were sold and sure enough they had lesions for tuberculosis. So how it got from the servant herd to the first herd, I don't yet know. But the reality is we ended up depopulating that site, the 2009 site. Uh, there was over 100 head of various servant species in the, on that property were depopulated at that time. Just so you'll know, all of our cases in southeast Indiana type back through whole genomic sequencing to the 2009 servant site. So they're all related. I uh, really appreciate because in 2008 and 9 we didn't have that technology. And now with that technology, we know at least these are related incidents, and that makes a big difference. In 2010, Pennsylvania calls. And they said, well, we've got two beef traces from Pennsylvania out of a packing plant out there. Again, the market was in Ohio. They four foot four pot loads of uh, fed cattle uh, loaded out of Eaton, Ohio, and went to a packing plant in Pennsylvania. The third load had one steer positive. The fourth load had one steer positive. No common consigners. I end up with a report that comes back from the Pennsylvania packing plant said that one of these animals weighed 846 pounds on the rail. It was black and he was about that big. Right? And that's what you got. And you just start looking. We tested cattle and herds all over. Ohio did the same since it was across the line. 
never did find on paper the origin of those steers. It wasn't until about six months ago they told me that that at tw- the 2010 steers were actually genetically linked to the 2011 herd we already knew about. But it was six years later before we actually found out where those steers came from. And if it hadn't been for whole genomic sequencing, we may never have known. So great tool, great technology. We did find a beef herd. Those were cows that were actually shipped to a Michigan packing plant. They were black cows, and they were about that big. Okay, so then we ended up with six or seven herds that we had to test in order to identify that herd. And I give this example particularly with producer groups on identification. And I know identification has been a great deal of conversation at this meeting and many others. But the reality is we've, we've worked hard on premises ID, but we need some idea on these animals. It takes weeks to find these. I mean, we spend a lot of time testing cattle that don't need to be tested, et cetera, trying to find where they are. So this is kind of the history of what happened with TB investigation in southeast Indiana. 2016, it's April of 2016, just about a year ago, state veterinarian of Pennsylvania calls and said, Brett, you've shipped some steers to us again. And six of those 11 steers that they don't have TB, I'll eat your hat. Now, this, remember, our last case was in 11. So now it's almost five years. I thought we were done with TB. We tested, we traced, we've done all these sorts of things. So the difference being this time is the packer buyer bought those 11 steers off the farm and he put a back tag on each of them. Now you may know from the animal disease traceability rules, those cattle, beef cattle, don't have to be specifically identified. We said, let's put some ID on those, and they have been. Turns out the packing plant in Pennsylvania, every one of those back tags was listed on that order as they're hanging on the rail out there by those back tags we could go to the indiana market and within three hours we were talking to the owner okay and this is on a friday now i don't know how about you but our calls always come on fridays (laughs) and so this is a friday afternoon the market operator actually stayed around a little later so we could get the records and sure enough in three hours we found this person so idea work and it works very well if it's in place and we can get this thing done turns out this fellow was running cows on two or cattle on two sites one's where the old cows are two's is where the wean calves and the fed cattle are feeds his own cattle he doesn't buy feeder cattle it's his own production. He's been feeding his own steers for a number of years, keeps the heifers back. We depopulated that site, 49 head, I think, on the two sites. He doesn't sell cull cows. They die on the property. So we didn't pick up cows. We picked it up on fed cattle. The interesting thing on this case, we believe it's been infected for a number of years. He's been selling his own steers for years. We've got records for the last several years. He sold 15. He sold 17, et cetera, nothing. This year or last, last year, April, he it launched this uh, whole investigation. So we set up, uh, we had two sites, they're about three and a half miles apart. We put three mile circles. There isn't anything that specifically requires circle testing on these. It's fence line contacts, adjacent herds, trace in, trace outs, but we decided to do three miles uh, since we'd been down that country before. This just gives you a little depiction of all these various cases over the years. The circles are 10 miles, so you can see kind of their relationship. The triangle, and I know you can't see this in the back, the first one was right here in a triangle. The servant herd is the pl- blue plus sign right next door. Then we dropped down here to this was the farm in 2011. And the steers, of course, came from here, we learned later. And then this is the new farm. There are actually two sites. One's closer to this 52 shield there. But the interesting thing about this case that uh, plays into this story a little bit later is this is the Brookville Reservoir. It was dammed several years ago. The east fork of the Whitewater River was dammed to make that reservoir several years ago. The west fork of the Whitewater River runs right through here. Here's a case. Here's a case. Here are the cases right along the river. So we played that into our epi as we looked on down the line. I don't want to touch that. I may do something here. In addition to doing the three-mile circles, you can see the two stars. Those were the two sites from the April 2016 case the three mile circles around those, but we went out 10 miles around those because we've been doing white-tailed deer surveillance during hunter harvest season for years. We started in 2009, we've been doing this for a number of years. Because of our close proximity to Michigan, we've been telling producers and hunters in Indiana about the the potential for having tuberculosis in those populations. So we've been talking TB in Indiana for a long time. So those uh, light blue dots are where deer have been harvested over the years. We've not found any white-tailed deer throughout this period of time, but nonetheless to give you some uh, special relationship for where that is, Cincinnati is just off to the southeast. 
In addition to taking the cattle off those two sites, we collected wild species off those sites, knowing, of course, we could have a, a reservoir in those populations because, again, it's been five years since our last case. Something is, is out there. And sure enough, on that uh, farm that uh, was down near the, uh, uh, the highway there uh, where the shield was on the map, we found a two-year-old white-tailed doe. That's the first positive wild species we've ever had in Indiana. Uh, that particular animal was not lesioned. You couldn't tell by looking at her. So we sent tissues in from everything that was sent in. We had white-tailed deer, possums, raccoons, uh, groundhogs. We took about everything. And I don't know how it is in your parts of the country, but you tell producers we want raccoons. We got plenty of raccoons. I mean, <laughs> these folks brought the raccoons in. So we called, uh, uh, they, it was called from that index farm. It was the site where the old cows were. So we knew we'd had infection there for some time. First case in Indiana. And as a result of finding a wild species, that three-mile circle goes to 10. So that's a requirement. And then, uh, as we mentioned here, we found one of those raccoons to be positive on that old cow site as well. So we had wild species affected. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. And boy, that certainly comes out kind of wild looking on there, doesn't it? This was a site, of course, where we had the wild white-tailed deer. We've been working the three-mile circles, and this was the summer of last year, and it's hot. So we were testing a lot of cattle in, in hot weather. From that site, we put a 10-mile circle around it. In addition to that, you can't see the river real well, but we decided to follow the river out of the state since we'd had a case in this part of the country in 2011. So we went two miles either side of the Whitewater River as it exits Indiana into Ohio. So that's kind of the look that we had, that unusual-looking pattern. Uh, with the corridor, the Whitewater River corridor and the 10 mile circle. Through premise registration program, we had about 550 registered cattle herds in this country, so we already knew that's about how many we might have. Didn't know that everybody still had cattle because that's kind of a cumulative total, but nonetheless, it gave us a baseline to work from. Worked out extremely well. People were very cooperative, and I'll talk a little bit more about our outreach initiatives in that area. Uh, most are small herds, most are on hillsides, uh, nearly all of them have no facilities, and so that's kind of the, the, you get the scenario that we're dealing with. Average age of the producers, mm, 75, uh, so they need help. If you're gonna test my cows, somebody's gonna have to come out and help. And so that's kind of the way we started. We had public meetings, uh, and again, the public meetings were not only for the cattle side, but we wanted to make sure the hunters were engaged. A lot of deer harvested from Franklin County, Indiana, it ranks in the top three in hunter harvest every year. A lot of deer down through that country. Door-to-door -door visits, in addition to the premises registration program, we wanted to make sure we didn't miss anybody. We started last summer with the leaves on, and you can't see from here to that door where cattle might be because it's pretty dense in some of those areas. I said, well, well, there'll be leaf off someday. They didn't make any difference. You couldn't see them anyway because they're back and down the hill and all those sorts of things. So door-to-door, -door, telephone calls. We, got, we had a real lucky stroke. You'll see Gene's name at the end of, of this presentation. Gene, Gene Dorfline actually grew up on the Duck Creek Road, which is the road that this infected farm was on, and knows everybody down there. And so she was our local point of contact in our office. They called Gene. Everybody knew Gene. So we did a lot of phone calls, and then, of course, advisories. Social media makes a world of difference. Uh, emails, U.S. mail, etc. Public meeting at the auditorium at the local high school. Uh, we had uh, several hundred people would show up just to advise them on what's going on. This is what the plan is. We need to get the cattle tested. Here's the timeline to get it done. The 10 mile circle gives you from the time of the diagnosis of a wild animal, you get six months to test the cattle. Now, six months in some areas, you might have eight or 10 herds in ranch country that are adjacent and what have you out here. I mean, we had hundreds of them trying to find them, get the cattle tested, get things done. So even though we had until early February, we said our goal is the end of 2016. So December the 31st, we want all these done because we knew we might have some carry forward. Uh, local government uh, center there in Franklin County, again, you can see the crowds came out. We had a lot of good participation from folks. Uh, logistics, of course, we needed to stage a lot of equipment. We had equipment that was brought in from surrounding states from the National Veterinary Stockpile. We used the Franklin County Fairgrounds. Similarly, uh, last year at this time, we were using the Boys County Fairgrounds for staging equipment in our high path uh, situation. And I noticed in some of the discussions earlier, Dr. Short was talking about the local response and the local people in the Keys. That's where this stuff happens. 
I mean, this uh, we needed the local folks. And you can see here we use private practitioners to test these cattle. There's an old Indiana statute that's been around a long time that says we can establish a contract for private practitioners to test the cattle, and the county pays for the test. So I don't know how many decades that's been on the book. So we reach out to the county, talk to the commissioners, say you need to reserve so many dollars based on our estimates on how many cattle need to be tested, and utilize local practitioners to get that work done. So we had 14 veterinarians who signed up. We had three or four that did the bulk of that work and did a lot of work. The reality is, as I mentioned, most of these needed facilities. We need a crowd set up. You got to hold the cattle 72 hours, of course, on these places, so you needed, it, uh, needed help. So we went back to the Department of Corrections. We used them in high path avian influenza to help us euthanize birds on site. We went back to them again and said, we just need muscle. We need people to hustle gates, set up corrals. After we're done, tear corrals down, take them to the county fairgrounds, clean and disinfect them so we can redispatch them to another site. So we use low level offenders again. And they volunteer for this duty. We got to know them rather well. Uh, fortunately, they come with their own staff, so the guards come with them and that sort of thing, so we don't have to worry about trying to manage them. Uh, the producers were fine with it. Uh, it worked out quite well because they understood they're not handling cattle. They're just handling equipment. We just need people to hustle things around to get the job done. And then, of course, we brought in uh, three federal testing teams, three teams of three, uh, to pick up some of these herds, and they say, well, we've got some of the more difficult herds. We knew that'd be the case because the ones that weren't veterinary clients were the ones the federal people got, right? And they were the tough ones. And so uh, folks that may have been bad pay, uh, any of a number of things uh, with the local practitioners, so that's uh, where it ended up. This is a picture of the county fairgrounds. You can see the chutes and equipment, uh, and everything was numbered. Everything was ordered. And it was all prescribed to go to a particular destination. So you just didn't drive out there and hook onto something. You might get hurt. Because <laughs> our staff had it all scheduled because it has to be at so-and-so's place for so many days. And that's why, particularly if you get into comparative cervicals, because the equipment had to stay there longer. So you had logistics issues. Anyway, you get that. But the reality was the county fairgrounds was a great place. Uh, the challenge that we ran into, the summer started, it was hot. You can see this looks like uh, fall last year. Then we got into some days it's 3 and 5 degrees, and you're kind of trying to clean and disinfect. So we pl put plastic uh, around the, an area, of the, actually it's a swine barn at the county fairgrounds, and you could end up with a skating rink pretty quickly, so you're trying to, you know, you get it. it so you had all those logistical issues and great, great teams to make it all happen. These are the offenders. They're actually tearing down the, the the gates uh, and getting back on these trailers so we can get them back to the fairgrounds. Great help. They worked out extremely well. If you're not utilizing this, these kind of personnel and these kind of events, they're cheap, <laughs> they're available, uh, and with a little training you can put them, uh, put them to work right away. They use them in other biological events. So for example, in high path AI, they're already fit tested. You didn't have to go through all that. They were already ready to go. So it was a great resource for us. Then lo and behold, we found another one. So in that testing program, in the 10-mile circle, through that surveillance, we found another beef cattle herd that was positive, roughly 40 head of cattle on this site. It was within the 10 miles, so we'd already done the 3 miles. So the 3 miles was already accomplished because it was already within those circles. T t trace investigations are underway. Those are almost complete now. Uh, we had a couple that went out of state that they're still trying to find, and Dr. Avril's giving me a hard time because actually out of all the traces we've done since this thing began, and there were the one in 2011 down in northern Deerenburg County, we did <coughs> dozens of traces to umpteen states. We didn't move TB anywhere. Well, he got the first one. So off of this site, we did have one that moved to Michigan, so he's depopulated the animals there. So we ended up with C. So this is where the third site showed up. Remember, A and B are associated with the same trace out of Pennsylvania. We found this herd. The positive side, or the, uh, the encouraging side of finding a wild animal was it put us in a 10-mile circle because if we had not done a 10-mile circle, we'd have missed C because we were working three-mile circles. And again, three-mile circles aren't even required. So if it hadn't been for the wild animal, we'd have missed C. And based on the whole genomic sequencing, they believe that herd has been there for a while as well. So I think these are old infections we're just now finding. Uh, why they pop the way they do, I'm uh, trying to get out of the TB business, but nonetheless, there's something that triggers that. 
I mean, those old cows on A have been there for years. He's fed his own steers for years. But something in April of 16, he's got positive lead. I mean, those lymph nodes as big as your fist. And you can take all the pictures out of all the books you've ever seen and put the Indiana pictures in because it's typical classic TB lesions. So this is the situation we ended up. Now we have a core surveillance area. And we tested throughout all the those light green areas. Great cooperation from a lot of people. People really pitched in to help. Uh, those public meetings really made a difference for us in the outreach. Uh, so they all understood what the goal was to be done by the end of the year. The other big component, of course, is wild white-tailed deer. We have a lot of them down there. So how do we accomplish this task? This is a map actually from our Department of Natural Resources. We have in Indiana a great relationship with DNR. Uh, when I first started in this business, uh, we didn't do a lot with the Department of Natural Resources. But over the years, the relationship and the interface between wild and domestic species and environmental health and one health and all that, even though we didn't dub it that way 10 years ago, we've got to know each other a whole lot better. I was concerned whether it might take some encouragement to get DNR to do a lot of testing in these populations. Didn't have to. I said, let's test deer. So they actually set up these zones. You can see the dots here. The, the red are the April 16, the two that we talked about. This is the Servid farm that we had in 2009. This is the cow herd we had in 2011. And so they worked that river corridor. They established these zones for sampling. And they basically said, hunters, we need these deer, if nothing else, the head, so we can collect tissues from those, get them to the diagnostic laboratory at Purdue, and if we can't get enough of them, we may have to come out and bring folks in to take deer. And that was encouragement enough. Uh, nobody's entering my property to take a deer off my place. How many deer do you want? And we were trying to determine if, indeed, we only had one positive, and it was at the lower red dot, in all of this experience. And we've tested umpteen deer down there over the years and hadn't found anything. And we encourage, we've had lots of pictures that have been sent out taxidermists, seasonal processors, all this sort of thing. I said, no, we've never seen anything like that. So I felt like there likely wasn't out there. On the other hand, I can't explain how this is moving around. It's got to be moving in some pattern. So they appealed to the hunting population, and Dr. Joe Caudill on the DNR staff was very helpful. and said, we're trying to find a 95% confidence of where this disease exists, and we're trying to determine if it exists at a quarter of a percent. So that's the level of testing we wanted in those deer. We want a confidence level to that point. Not sure we could get it, but man, did they show up. We literally had pickup truck loads of deer heads delivered to these stations. The other thing that changed a few years ago where I was concerned is our Indiana DNR, as a convenience to the hunters, set up a system where you could check in your deer online. So you didn't have to go to the local grocer or the gas station or whatever to check in your deer. You could do it online. Well, it made it a whole lot harder to get samples. They didn't show up. But the darker the, the brown, so to speak, the more deer. But, man, they showed up. And we didn't try to determine whether it's infected or not by what it looked like. We collected tissues on all, to, uh, greater than 2,000 of those. They all went to the lab based on the experience with the one that was not lesion. That it turned out to be positive. We didn't want to miss one, so everything went to the laboratory. This is throughout that area, even beyond. You can see the circles in the core surveillance area. Some of the darkest blocks are in our core surveillance area. As it turns out, they brought in the deer. And I was really, really encouraged with that. As a result of that, we have a 95% confidence that it doesn't exist greater than a quarter percent, exactly what our goal was, because of the number of samples that were brought in. And uh, people were really, uh, really, really helpful. In addition to the regular hunting season, DNR established a permitting system in that the red circle is the core area that says that landowners, if you want to take additional deer, will give you a permit to do that. And so there's still been, and that uh, ran through the end of last month, March the 31st, just last week, so there were additional deer collected off of some of those sites as well. But I've encouraged. We didn't find anything else as a result of the hunter harvested sampling program. The other thing that I may have happened is... You know, it, it, again, my concern was it's moving in deer or it's moving in something because I can't tie these cattle herds by cattle. And when we went to those sites in the two circles here, A and B, that man had, it's a pretty quiet operation. He had good records back 10 years, and I couldn't put it, I couldn't link him back to anything. And I said, it's got to be moving somewhere else. 
I don't know that it, we could not prove that it's in the white-tailed deer population. It may have been at one time at a very low level. It may be below a quarter percent yet, so we're going to continue to do this testing. I think EHD may have helped us. There have been a lot of deer died off over these years in these areas because of EHD, and, and we get reports of that all the time, so that may have helped us actually on the TV front. Here's some of those deer heads, bagged them. They brought them to one of the DNR properties down there, and it was, uh, it was quite a task to get those done. Our laboratory really did a nice job. Anything suspicious, of course, went on to the National Vet Services Laboratory. So we tested 380 cattle herds down there. Um, we had a, a couple left to do at the time this slide was prepared. They've been done now, 6,500 head of cattle. Uh, and the trace investigations are ongoing on that second herd. But, again, great cooperation from a lot of people. I'll have to tell you a story. I was down at uh, Connersville, Indiana, in Fayette County at a producer meeting. And one of the guys who had his cattle tested came up to me after the meeting. And he said, you know, your folks came out and tested my cattle. And a couple of days afterwards, one of my cows died. And he wanted to know if I could compensate him for his loss. <laughs> so I said, unfortunately, no, I don't have a way to pay you uh, for that. It's certainly not our goal to kill your cattle and what have you. We don't like looking for any mortality. But I think it, as a producer from that area, you need to understand, we found some cattle down there you couldn't kill. I mean, we, we found cattle. I don't think I've ever seen anybody anymore. Uh, Pretty uh, rangy cattle, but they all have 840 tags in their ears now <laughs> because we're going back. Now, we won't do all that area, but we're going to get back to that core area, and we're going back. We're going to test cattle again. So they've all got 840s in their ears now. Good cooperation from a lot of people. Trace out investigation. They're continuing on the second herd. We don't have that second one depopulated. Uh, we just took a cow off uh, two days ago off that site. We have additional infection on that site. Uh, USDA is evaluating it with regard to the indemnity uh, opportunity there. I'm trying to get them moved off the property because I want them off the landscape. The owner is not so inclined. So uh, we're working through that process now. So what's next? Test those remaining cattle herds. They're done now. Uh, uh, containing those traces from the second herd, we had some movement that ended up in uh, Michigan and Ohio. And so they're completing that and then developing for a plan for area testing. Not only our goal is to test the cattle in that core area, again so we're already staging up for that uh, we send a lot of that equipment home but we didn't send it all home because we're going to need some more as we start in on this round and then the plan continued for white-tailed deer this fall so we're not done on the deer side as well so i'm really really encouraged with where we are been a lot of work uh, a lot of collaboration from a lot of people uh, and appreciate the local response that we've had down there the farm service agency office has been very helpful so the federal office on that side uh, extension is extremely helpful. Everything down to the local schools let us use their rooms for meetings, you know, all that sort of thing. They just want to do whatever they can to help, and it's been very encouraging. Just to remind you, uh, we these we always used to take our lesion pictures from Michigan. Uh, now we have our own. Uh, that's unfortunate, but those servant lesions, those pearls, you've heard about the pearls. We've had pearls, just as they described on the rib cage. And we tell hunters to be looking for pearls or anything unusual. What's really neat now is for years we've had calls from hunters. We've encouraged them. We put it in the Indiana Hunter's Guide. If you see anything unusual in your deer, give us a call. And they've called for many, many years. What's cool now is when they call you on a Sunday morning after their Saturday night hunt or whatever it is, that they can send you pictures by text, right? And that's really, really nice. And they say, well, no, I don't think that's what it is or whatever. This is a lesion from cattle. And, of course, we've got scads of pictures now. But cutting those, they're gritty on the cut service, just like you might expect. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we can get to the end of this here very shortly. But a lot of cooperation from a lot of people. And that's Jean. If you want to talk to Jean, that's where you can reach her. But she's our point of contact for coordinating all, all this at the local level. So I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today to talk about our progress in the program. I'm encouraged where we are. We're not done. We're continuing to move forward. But uh, with help and the cooperation from a lot of people, I'm, I'm uh, hopeful we'll be successful.